Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we are speaking with Tom Forker. Am I, am I saying that right? Yep. Uh, yep. All right. And I thought it'd be really cool to have you in because we've we've had people from like the, the head of HOK and airport designers and, and everything else to people who are striking out on their own. I, I think right. it's a really cool cross section to get people who have far less to risk. I find there's a lot of creativity and a lot of opportunity and free ideas and everything in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also great to interview people that have accomplished a lot towards the end of their career too, to see where people who at one time were starting out have gone. So to get that kind of uh, back and forth and, mm -hmm. and difference between things has always been really interesting to me. And I saw your sketches on Instagram. You're always yep. posting sketches and yep. uh, I thought they're really interesting because the for one, the things that you select to sketch is always an interesting process. And I remember uh, in architecture school, starting out with a sketchbook and everything I sketched was just crap. And by the end of it, it's yeah. like you could just look at something and it would transfer from reality through your head and through your hand and it would look the same. And that ability to, to sketch with practice was just always amazing to me. And it's obvious to me that you practice a ton from your sketches. Yeah, I it's do. really pretty. I don't even know how I even got to this point, but the, the <laughs> thing is about like, you know, I just did it from school, you know, I did it in my free time and then, you know, it's more technical looking, the sketches probably than most. It, it reeks of an architect is sketching this. Yeah. Like it, they, all, they always have that same look when you, when you see an architect sketch right. for some reason. Yeah, it's a do, real actually. accurate, but gestural. Right. There's a, there's a weirdness there. That... Yeah, it's kind of loose, but not not too loose. You know? Right, right. <laughs> uh, try and keep this thing pretty pretty close to your mouth and not yeah. bang the table too much because it'll okay. it'll translate into that. But um, give me a little little bit of your history. You sent me kind of a, a brief of the the your history a little bit, but walk me through it a little bit and we'll see where we go. Yeah, I was always interested in um, just outdoor environmental things. So that's what got me into landscape architecture initially. So, so why did you that. do that first rather than architecture? Um, and then why did you do architecture? Well, then the first thing is I always wanted to do architecture. So I was always like interested in that. And at the time I was looking around for schools that had architecture and I just didn't really, I don't feel like I felt fit in with the or initially with the the crowd of architecture so i felt landscape was a little more my speed now ah, why go into that a little bit more that's interesting i to just me. i was always into like uh you know ecology and urban forestry that kind of thing and mm -hmm. that's what kind of drew me to landscape architecture first yeah and then i kind of gradually as i was going through arch landscape architecture i basically started looking at architecture as more of a you know it's more of a, a substantial industry yeah i think now you spent three years in DC working at yep. a at a land uh, landscape firm there. Yep, several. Yep. And what kind of work did you do there? Commercial, residential? Uh, I did initially commercial. Yep. Um, did things for like Arlington and Alexandria, Virginia, and some DC. Cool. And then I moved to DC and started working for another firm there as well. Yep. How did how did you enjoy the process and and the creativity and and the the scope of the work that you would do in a landscape firm yeah the, the creativity is great um just it wasn't enough for me at the time i felt like i was just like it was always lacking in terms of creativity in what way um just the freedom to to express you know your your kind of ideas it was more of just production work at that point mm -hmm. and just kind of pumping out drawings now was that because of the firm or because of the nature of landscape design you think um, it may have been the firm culture. I'm not yep. sure exactly, but I mean, I worked for another firm as well and it was very, very similar, yep. but it was a little more freedom based and do what you want every day. So, right. Which was great. And but, so how did you eventually go from, uh, that kind of work into like make the decision to go into architecture? Uh, basically that was around the time that it was the economy is kind of slowing down around mm -hmm. the housing crisis. So are we talking like 2005 to 10 kind of situation. 2008 or 9, okay. around that area. And then it was just kind of the tail end of most of the, the housing crisis. So mm -hmm. there wasn't a, as much work. So they were kind of like, they put me on as an independent contractor at yep. the end, towards the end. And they're like, you can stay or you can continue your hours here. Right. Or you can, um, you know, just go do your own thing. So 
decided to do your own thing? So uh, yeah, I went and did my own thing and went and got my master's in architecture. So, so how did you enjoy architecture school? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, yeah, it was a, like a freedom of just nonstop creativity and. Now, did you shadow any architects before you went into architecture school? Um, not really, because I had a, a good idea of what architecture was by working in other firms. So, yeah, um, I didn't really worry about the day to day stuff as much. Yeah, I I shadowed one architectural firm and then worked in an architectural firm when I, while I was in school. Mm. And the architects at the firm I shadowed did not that they expressed mostly how difficult their job was. Yeah. Which I agree with. It's it, an yeah, extremely it's difficult, difficult it um, thing. And it, it takes an incredible amount of determination, the correct personality and all you know, that and more yeah. to actually, you know, be successful at it, right. and especially to run your own firm. So right. it's a bit of an uphill battle. How do you, how are you managing that? Um, it's just, it's every day is just you know, trying to find something new and, you know, trying to uh, create and make and just do all sorts of different things mm -hmm. um, instead of just getting bogged down into like one little aspect of the, right. the industry. So you spent, after architecture school, did you go immediately out to Montana, is it? Yep. Yeah, I got a job like right the, probably the same month I graduated. So I just moved everything out, packed everything up and went out there. And So was it just endless ski houses out there? Or? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, you know, it was there was some smaller homes, but it was mostly Yellowstone Club kind of um, chalets and um, some just larger 15,000 square foot homes that are everywhere up Whoa. there so yeah that's uh i was thinking 1500 that's really small oh wait thousand yeah they're they're big they're big houses and they just required a lot of attention just yeah there's not as much detail it's just it's big homes yeah how did how did you feel uh the the um the contentment or the the feedback the the how did you feel working on those kind of projects endlessly um it got it got a little, um, I don't want to say boring, but it just it, it became very monotonous yeah. almost. It was became kind of robotic. Yeah. And, and work. again, was that because of the firm, you think, or the work, no matter what, would be that? And um, and were you to uh, transform that firm into something that would not have been uh, um, hypnotic or uh, monotonous? How, how would you do that? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I think that the the firm that I was in was a really one of the better firms in the area mm -hmm. for that type of work. And I think that that high end residential kind of requires a person to look at a home as just not through the lens of like, um, the client, but you have to look at it as almost like a industrial sized building at that point because of all mm. the systems and stuff like that. So I think the working in a firm like that really helped me understand like, there are homes like this and you know, you can work within them, I guess. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the design for the, the home is just, it's incredible how you have to come up with some of these floors and how they all work and, and it's building on a mountain, most of these, these lots. So, so the, the building sites are pretty, most well, of the a lot sites of times pretty steep. Yeah, they were like pretty steep and mo most of them were, you know, on pylons and things like that. Oh, so wow. they're, some of them were just hanging off of cliffs, basically. <laughs> so, I mean, it seems like that would be a really interactive, yeah. engaging uh, firm to work for with with a lot of challenges. Yeah. Um. But but you grew a little uh, bored of that. Yes, I just I felt like I had like something else to offer. Mm -hmm. Um. I just I didn't really ever get to get that point. It was always just the same kind of door hardware schedules and. Just too many people above you in the firm, you think? Um, or? Not really. I mean, there's a few people, but there were. Just, it was just a, a smaller firm. It was probably about 20 people, mm. but it wasn't like you know, it wasn't like I was going to go anywhere beyond what they were doing. So, right. I just saw the the writing on the wall at that point. So, was it uh, if if you had had more uh, control or influence on the direction of design from the beginning? It would have been something that would have been able well, to retain more. I don't know if it was so much more. design because the the owner was mostly the only person that really designed. Mm. Um, we were just kind of like the 
we just made it work basically implementing what the owner designed yeah, so exactly. so maybe that could be a thing that an owner of a firm could consider that to to let go of this design maybe. some degree yeah, yeah to absolutely. keep people because i've heard that uh, from a lot of people, and I, I myself experienced that as well when I worked at a firm mm -hmm. in Michigan. There's like you're just drawing someone else's creativity constantly. Yeah, it feels like yeah, you just yeah, which is, which is a learning process. But at the same time, if you are a creative person, you're wanting to put yeah. yourself in a position to actually be grappling with a problem to be solved from your own Correct. experience yep. with your with your own vision and the, the difficulty of um, letting that part of your mind and yep. creativity do nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And make sure you do the technical aspects of it right. That's what I would always suffer with when I was at a firm, uh, probably not nowhere near doing the same level of stuff that you were probably involved with yeah. but uh, it was a you know essentially a summer job uh during architecture school doing big lake michigan lakefront houses yep. and it would be a lot of uh stick on stone and <laughs> yeah the design wasn't really there and lick, on, lick and stick <laughs> yeah and and i i wasn't designing at all i had no clue how to design at the time anyways mm -hmm. i was you know and don't have really any clue how to design now because I haven't done it in like 15 years. So, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so retention of people at the beginning stages, uh, to not lose a valuable employee, give them more leeway and design and interaction at that point mm -hmm. coming from your experience anyways. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. So, the, your firm in Montana that you were with yep. has scaled back and you're now a free agent. Correct. What do you do? That's why I created TF Works. So <laughs> that, well, I had it created a little bit and you know, I was working on some of the, the stuff in the background, but yep. I always felt like that that was always going to be the answer to the, the antidote to this, you know, the problem that I've seen in so many firms. Yep. And what was the problem that you've seen in so many firms that you'll be solving or attempting to work on with TF Works. Um, so there's a lot of things. I mean, I just I like the aspect of working on a different different things like cinematography, photography, architecture, um, landscape architecture. I just didn't want to be stuck in you know the paradigm of just doing architecture. Or, you know, the rest of my life. Now the the challenge with being able to make money is that you have to specialize. Yes. To some degree. Some degree. Yes. How how are you going to do that? So through Mostly it's going to be through architecture. Uh -huh. um, it's going to be, you know, one to two projects a year, probably. That would be uh, nice. Uh, yeah, I have one right now, and it's, you know, it's it's enough to get me through the rest, maybe next year too. Um, yeah. And it'll keep me busy through, at least through next year. Um, and then after that, you know, it's just, it's going to be, you know, I'm trying to document this as I go in a blog and, you know, photographs and some video and things like that and kind of get myself engaged in the YouTube kind of creator sense mm -hmm. um uh what's his name eric grinehold was a yep. great um inspiration to me so yeah he's got a lot of, of great videos for advice on um like going out on your own and yeah. learning how to stay uh balanced as far as having your your feet spread pretty wide and in multiple places rather right. than just singularly singularly doing one thing yeah. i've worked with him quite a bit and he's a great guy he's very uh very active creatively with you know with youtube writing books yeah exactly design he's a great designer and everything else as well so yeah he's been uh he's been a big push for me to actually do that kind of stuff as well yeah and i think he myself and you all had the same kind of feeling when working for another firm that it it didn't feel completely fulfilling to yes. not be your own boss correct um but the downside of not being the downside of being your own boss is that you're also responsible for the money. Correct. <laughs> yep. That's and the finding work part. and you know all yeah, that stuff. finding work and all that. Yeah. So how do you how do you balance? Okay, you've got one job. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know you're not going to go broke and have to go back to boring in a year and a half? Um, I think that that's the, the the drive that I need. You know, I think that me too. You know what I mean? <laughs> like just to know that I'm on the verge of like you know right possible disaster you know but it's 
you know, that keeps me going. It keeps me motivated. Yeah. And to keep, you know, keep making things and finding different ways to make and do architecture, really. I mean, right. I'm looking for another way of making architecture and not just doing the, the standard um, the standard practice. What ideas do you have about uh, mixing that up and, and transforming it a bit? Um. So again, yeah, I'll do some YouTube and that kind of generates some income as well. And what then, kind of videos do you do on YouTube? Uh, right now I only have like two videos up, but, uh, just kind of like small little, um, you know, making like a model or something like that or creating or drawing. Actually, I have a, a few videos that I'm ad- editing right now of just drawing, mm-hmm. um, just kind of tutorials, courses almost, and then just kind of moving into like just a, a blog style format. Right. Uh, I talking about sketching. I I think I'd noticed one of your sketches in your Instagram feed somewhere where it's all very pretty straight, um, mm-hmm. shorter straight lines, and there's a car involved, and they're all fairly architecturally straight lines, right? Yep. And then there's there was this one line that delineated the driver's door, I think, from top to bottom. And it just with with one stroke, you had done this perfect like curve at the top part of the door, mm-hmm. and first three fourths of the door, and then at the bottom there was like a you know a line that the designer had put down the lower portion of the car, and it was just one hand stroke of a. Zip, 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 zip. Oh. I mean, it was just yeah. like perfect. And when you see these people do like calligraphy, and they just these seamless hand motions. Yeah, that, it's just that practice at that point. Yeah, it that was. Uh, I remember looking at that one thing and just catching this one line, <laughs> and it's like, geez, I, I guess it's just massive repetition. Yeah, it's just yeah. It, when I started drawing, it was probably oh my god, I don't know, in high school. That's when I really got interested in architecture. Is really in high school in art classes, and mm-hmm. I became you know the guy, the go-to guy in class to like you know hey, how do you do this? Sketch a horrible picture yeah, of exactly. uh, Mr. Burns over here so we can <laughs> laugh at it. Or- <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like little things like that. And, you know, I became like the, the class kind of, uh, you know, aid almost in terms of like going around helping people. But right. And then I got to college and, you know, I took drafting because that was pretty much the last year it was offered hand right. drafting. And I kind of learned all my technical skills there and took a bunch of art classes as well. That was pretty much the, you know, and I'm, I'm always interested in art and I'm always looking at different artists and things like that and how yep. they draw and, um, that's that that's kind of a weird point for me where I know extremely little about photographers, mm-hmm. the technicality of photography. Uh yeah, but your stuff looks great. I mean I've, Well, it's all um experimentation, failure, yeah. and intuition. Like with photography, it's the one thing that I've gone into where I knew right off, like, oh, I I get this. Yeah. With the composition and light. And then you know, the the post production, Photoshop, and the blending of layers, but still blending to look like you're not there blending them. Yeah, the, um, all of that came very second nature to me. So I, as soon as I got into it, I kind of knew like some there's something here for me that I can excel at. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for some reason, I've never. Um, I'd I'd probably be a little better off for it, but. I've I've never um, held uh, mm. education or people who've accomplished the same thing in extremely high regard, and that sounds like a weird, very weird thing to say. But I mm. I did not enjoy school, and I I don't know the work of others very much. Okay, I don't know why. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's a you know. It... I, I don't know if it's just some absurd arrogance that is really actually hurting me in the long run. Like I could be doing a lot better maybe if, but there's something about knowing that what you've created was as much as possible unmolested by the, the direct influence of like, you're not completely. There's no bad habits. Copying yeah. or, it's just, you're creating your own. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is, I've only run into one other person who's reflected that same sentiment yeah. in, in creativity, uh, which is interesting. But at the same time, we hold in common this very, like, I can't work for someone else. I lose motivation, and I'd rather live in a cardboard box. That's what yeah, I kind of came I mean, that's to. That's pretty much what it is. Yeah, it, it was like, if you paid me half a million a year 
to come to this desk every day, it just wouldn't be worth it for me. I'm right. sorry, but I, it's for me, that's not where life is going for me. I can't, right. I'd rather be broke and, uh, doing something of my own fruition rather than, mm -hmm. uh, being very, you know, monetarily successful, but being a, not creating my own, what my own voice has come up with. And there's different personalities and different people yeah. for, for accomplishing those things. So yeah. that was kind of like in, in just our little communication back and forth, it was interesting to me to see that commonality of like, I'm, I'm creative. I enjoy doing these things, but I'm yeah. not, uh, I'm not going to be able to stick with doing this for someone else. Right. But now you have that crazy challenge in front of you. How do you, how do you be self-employed without imploding or going broke? Right. Yep. And that's yeah. a pretty a huge task to take on. Yeah. I remember driving around town when, when I was starting out looking at people that were driving new cars mm -hmm. and just kind of thinking like, how on earth does anyone ever like personally earn enough money to make payments on something like that every month like yeah. it's and just be okay with it I mean, and just, just yeah be okay with it get a mortgage and kids and, and then a mortgage and kids and yeah, yeah. and then not too long after that my wife said we're never going into debt for anything anymore ever <laughs> And I was like, oh, I have to earn cash for everything. Yeah. All right. Well, that's <laughs> another thing. I, you know, I made sure I was out of debt before I just uh, got great, into this. Great move. Yeah. Great move. Yeah. Well, pretty much out of debt. But I mean, there's, you know, there's always things like that and student yep. loans and stuff. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I just didn't want to get into this and be already, you know, behind in behind financially. You know, it just, yeah, exactly. I just didn't right. want to make it harder for myself. It already is hard enough. So uh, tell me about what you have currently going on and and how you think that might parlay into further work, if that's the right word. Yeah, so right now I have uh, one project out in Montana, just a little uh, lake house. Well, mm -hmm. it's like multiple homes within, um, it's like a little guest cottage and there's a garage and there's some other things that are, but it's on a lake and it's you know pretty remote. So um, some of that project may influence some other projects in that, in that area, but uh, I'm not sure about the New England area and getting projects through that. So right. that's the only difficult part about that. Is that a, is that an off grid uh, kind of no, thing it, where it's, it's at? Or? No, it's like a development, but it's, you know, there's no one living up there as of right now. So yep. right now it's just a, it's remote. <laughs> First in the development. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think my parents just moved into a place and I've seen other developers do this where they go in and they build all the houses, but they only finish the exterior. Oh. And then the interior is left bare studs. Yeah. So the neighborhood looks finished. Complete. Yeah. And so people come in and they just finish out the interior for each oh, interesting. person coming in. Yeah. It's a interesting building or a business model, I guess. Hmm. But they have like a little catalog that you can pick from like countertops and I don't know. I could never live in a development, so I didn't get that far. Yeah. That's another weird thing where yeah. my parents are very like, oh, everything's gonna be uniform. Yeah. Great. Sign me up. And I'm kinda <laughs> like, mm, I need the freedom to paint like a pink rainbow on here if I want. So Yeah, I mean, yeah, do whatever you want. Right. That's, right. <laughs> that's uh, you know, up to you. But the yeah, that's what I love about it, because it's just, you know, you have the freedom to choose what you want to do every day and there's no one telling you like, hey, we got to get this done by tomorrow. And it's yeah. like, you know, self-imposed deadlines and things like well, that. Well, hopefully your client at some point is expecting well, some yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're they're moving slowly on it. So I'm just kind of working on other things right now. And then um, they've already signed the contract. So I just, I'm waiting for them to get their survey done and things like that. Oh, cool. So I can keep moving forward. Nice. Um. <clears throat> In in developing a business for the future for yourself, what do you have as like a five to ten year kind of dream update, if you will? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just I'm trying to keep it small for right now. You know, just trying to keep the overhead really low and not have to worry about you know paying interns or anything like that or mm -hmm. buying. You know, interns can work for free, right? Well, you can take advantage <laughs> of them, like. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting you take advantage of interns just to be, but I've, I've seen I've heard, it in yeah, I've so heard many me. situations where people just, it, I, I don't really agree with the whole 
intern model yeah, honestly it's kind of weird especially like the new york city kind of i don't know i don't know how people live i mean it's like it, they it get seems a, stipend, a little predatory to me it like it, it it was weird like coming out of architecture school the firms that you'd most want to work with would pay the least right because they knew we can get the good people yep um and it was the same like my wife's a pt and it was the same with pt that if you wanted to work in an i think it's called outpatient place mm -hmm. where someone's had surgery and they or they're an athlete and they come to you to get um yeah you know uh, back in tip-top shape uh that was the situation that you were going to use most of your creativity as a physical therapist and everything else but those people knew that's where the students wanted to go correct so they just pay less and that yeah. just yeah it always seemed kind of weird to me too i don't know i was just i don't get it <laughs> yeah that was pretty that was like the washington tc model as well like really i felt like if you wanted to work for a big firm there or somebody that was good they knew it and then they they made you pay for it yeah in i'm more way than one i'm finding that more of the firms that are run by people my age mm -hmm. Uh, are much more highly rewarding their employees, giving them a lot more freedom of schedule, yep. a lot more pay, and a lot more vacation time. Because mm -hmm. there's an I, I think people are realizing that you know turnover of employees, and and I think um, were you personally to be working in a situation like that, if I was working in a situation like that, if we're you know common in that way, yeah. Um, they they give them a lot more. They're they're more selective. They're saying you've got to show a lot of talent before we hire you. Mm -hmm. But once we do hire you, you're going to have a lot of responsibility as far as design goes. You'll oh be yeah, involved a to a high degree. Yeah. But you'll also get a lot of time off. You know, good pay, and freedom. You know, much more control over your own schedule. Mm -hmm. And to me, that instead of getting someone who's in this high constrain and like you're only working and you're going to do your best work for us and you're going to you know 12 hour day and yeah i when you're working with creativity in that manner i just don't think it thrives it long term in that and i think you end up with high turnover and i think firms are starting to realize that a bit and yeah. and kind of come around to i think more of a european australian kind of uh lifestyle of a firm or whatever yeah so. absolutely i mean i had to sign an nda saying that i wouldn't moonlight and things like that and really before i started working so i mean they know i mean if you if you're you know gonna walk away from them they want to at least get something out of you right <laughs> that's the way it is i guess <laughs> but so where are you physically based out of right now western mass western mass yeah all right so how long your drive today uh almost two uh, three hours yeah so uh, i came favorite podcasts two. What's that? Favorite podcast to listen to while driving? Oh, I, of course. Eight, architecture and Design and Photography. Oh, well. Okay. Right. But uh, course, yeah, I had sure. on. What else <laughs> did I have on today? A uh, few others that were just playing randomly in the background. Yeah. So, Yeah. I'm. Let's see if I listen. I like to... Do you listen to How I Built This at all? No. I haven't heard that one. That is a good one, especially okay. starting out a business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an NPR show with Guy Raz, but okay. really good. They take the founders of companies yeah. and they they interview them through their whole oh, uh, wow. business history mm -hmm. and they it's interesting though you should go from this how it started to how it almost completely failed but how they made it mm. and are you know now wherever they're at that yeah. you know justifies interviewing them and it, it's a really interesting uh look into the mind of entrepreneurial spirit where these ideas come from uh, how they're implemented, the, the mistakes people make, and and how it turns into something that's ultimately been fairly successful for them. Yeah, it's a it's a really good listen. It's really well done. Awesome. Cool. Recommended enough. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. Perfect. Perfect. It's yeah. Drive home. <laughs> It'll yeah. give you some uh, yeah. fodder fodder for your drive home. Yeah. Um. Talk to me about your creative process. Like, really dig deep and give me where. Where does creativity come from for you? What inspires it? Um, and why do you think you're creative and in what areas are you creative in? Um, definitely drawing, painting, uh, definitely creative in those areas and things like that. But um, where it comes from, I'm not exactly sure. It's more of like a, my upbringing. I think my parents left me to kind of like create my own, you know, 
world. Sometimes they just throw you know a bunch of toys at me, and you know I'd be playing along by myself and things like that. <laughs> I'm very much an introvert, so yep. Um, you know, as as a kid, I was growing up, I was kind of a not a loner, but I was just kind of you know, I felt like I was always not like into playing with other kids and things like that. I have a, a sister, but it's not like I was a older sister, younger, younger. Um, it's a weird thing that it does seem like most people you run into that are highly visually creative and expressive in that way. Yeah. Seem to be a little more withdrawn from the mainstream of yeah. social, whatever in high school and everything else, yep. especially, especially. Um, I wonder why that is. That's, I don't know. I think it's more, yeah, just your how your mind works and the uh, the psychology of it. Really, I mean, it's just like mm. I feel like you're just paddling upstream sometimes, but <laughs> it's worth it. I mean, I feel like it is. But. Well, do you ever have the feeling like if I were like everyone else, I'd be worthless? Sometimes, yeah. And I don't know how I I I get that a lot. Yeah, but it's a paradoxical thing because if you could just fit in life would be a lot easier in many yeah. circumstances yep. but at the same time the thing that you are drawn to and that you desire and that you're uh that you're so interested in w would be gone right like there there's some kind of weird complexity that that gives uh, a visually creative and oriented introvert especially mm -hmm. Uh, this oddity about them yeah. that that does put them oddly outside of just the commonality of mm -hmm. things that uh, it's like a, you know, it's it's this like burden, but it's something, it's like a, a really annoying baby that, you know, is annoying, but it's your baby. And yeah. If anyone tries to take it, you'd beat him to death. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's really what it is. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know where like the creativity in me comes from, to be honest, but I, I just felt like I was always just uh, inherently just wanted to do something creative every day. And I think that was a lot of the drive that sent me towards arts and or fine arts, really. And then, mm. you know, that kind of pushed me through high school. I was never good in high school. I was maybe like a B student. Yeah. Never was interested in school. And then I got to college and I got straight A's, 4-0. Right there with you, except yeah. I, I was horrible in high school. Yeah. Uh, and then I tried to go pre med and like I really applied myself mm -hmm. and I got like B minuses. And oh, I was like, okay. this isn't going to work for me. And, <laughs> and I took a year or two off and went back to architecture school because I had a friend who was going and I saw what they were doing. And I was like, geez, that looks amazing. Yeah. So, did that and I'm I'm really glad I did. I wouldn't wouldn't go back and do anything differently. Um, even not though I'm not that. practicing as an architect, I'm I'm highly involved in the design world as a photographer. Right. So kind of a odd um way. Well, I mean you found your place, you found your niche and you know, you found it through architecture, but it wasn't necessarily architecture, but right. that's how it ended up. Some weirdness going on there. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but um so I have this theory that that I think I think everyone's creative. Yeah, to some extent. So tell me about where you're not creative. Hmm. Where someone else might be that might not be generally considered creative. I think people that are creative in business and accounting and that kind of thing. There we go. That's something that I would be like, you know, that's like I'd look at that. The, and I'd that's be like, like dark arts for me. I, yeah, right. It's right. like I don't know what what you're doing, but I, I know how to like do how basic accounting. But I mean, how like, far do you get through a legal document before you're like, I don't care if this puts me in jail. I can't read this whole thing. The ARE test was, you know, a nightmare. Oh, you, yeah. So you took that. that. Yeah. Oh, wow. So all that stuff was just kind of like good for you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the law is kind of straightforward for, for the most part. You just got to memorize some contracts. But I mean, there's some other things like that you need to know, but liability wise, but yeah. it's not something that's, it comes up a lot, especially in architecture world. Yeah. Unless no, you're working with some crazy really, clients. I guess. It, it, it's, it's always an interesting thing to me to consider creativity because of my experience with my wife being very not creative mm -hmm. in the ways that I'm creative. 
I used to say she's not creative at all, but she absolutely is. She's an incredible uh, uh, kind of narrative-driven creative. Mm -hmm. So I think she could probably be a really good writer. Um, hmm. I find her enraptured by her own daydreams. Oh, okay. <laughs> like she'll be sitting there <laughs> looking at the wall like, at nothing and be completely like bug-eyed like, and I'll be like, you all right? And she'll be like, stop, stop, stop. Like <laughs> she's watching her own daydream and, and wondering where it's Whatever going. Whatever works, I guess. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you know you're in control of that daydream, <laughs> right? Why is it amazing you? And, and it, I think she's, I think what she's doing is like someone sketching a floor plan, looking at all the possibilities yeah. and then the problems. Yeah. But she's looking at it relationally. Okay. As as human relations, but she's creatively making these relationships as a daydream or whatever. Yeah. And seeing like if this person did that, then maybe that person would do this and how would they react? And yeah. And and I'm starting to see that to me, we've always all we've always all, there's some absolutes for you. Mm -hmm. We we seem to always uh paint creativity as far more in the visual realm. It's kind of our go-to, like, oh, you must be an artist. And by that, we mean slapping paint on canvas. But it it it, it goes so much further in just visual realm. Yeah. And then you get into, like, storytelling and accounting and engineering, designing. Like, yeah. you know, there's all these other realms. And the, the thing that I've found most is, like, uh, there are areas in my life like i feel like i'm highly creative because of the common understanding of creativity yeah but then i look at the parts of my life where i'm not creative where i hit a wall or mm -hmm. like extremely frustrated with things and yeah. it feels impossible for me to do something and being a fellow introvert yeah i mean try and create conversation at a mixer with sitting there with a yeah. drink in your hand and imagine I don't I don't drink, yeah. So it's like ten times worse. I don't even drink either, so it's, oh, geez. it's hard for me to like. Even so like imagine socially like socially engage. <laughs> yeah. So you got to go and like talk to you know these contractor types or whoever else that might be more extroverted and right, just yeah. kind of like, hey, what do you do? What do you do? I yeah. And I come away from those things whenever I've done anything like that, and it's just it's just Chinese water torture, man. Yeah. It's horrible. It's just yeah, horrible. I agree. I can't create that situation right like it's outside of my realm well and a lot of it is it's not it's not planned also mm -hmm. i'm like more of a planner in my head so mm -hmm. if it's not something that i've created or plans out in my head interesting and if it's more of like an uh, abstract or just kind of like just random talk it's it it's kind of uh you know it, it really stresses me out not stresses me out but like just kind of makes right. it harder for me to to focus so like what about right now like just this <laughs> weird conversation like we've never met but all of a sudden like yeah. do, does this kind of thing stress you out or are you talking about things that you're interested enough in to where it's like right it's not i'm bothering. interested in this conversation so i'm engaged right. totally you know i'm giving you my whole focus here but you know if i was in like in a busy room and with multiple right. people that i'm never probably going to see again it's, right it's a hard for me hard for me to understand that yeah what am I doing? <laughs> what did I do wrong in life that I ended and, up here? And people look at you like, "What? What are you crazy? Like, you know, that's that's you know, networking or whatever, oh, and this and that." And it's it's like, horrible. It's for me. It's just. It's. I mean, it's out of my comfort zone, really. To, so to out go out of my and do that. So, zone. but like for a lot of people, I I have a friend who uh, just absolute people connector. You mm -hmm. know, she can just. She just goes and finds people that she knows these people were, work well with these people. And she's yeah. just constantly connecting people and she's understanding reading and connecting people like that. And I, I look at the areas where I have this high frustration or anxiety around like yeah. conversations in a mixer. Uh, my wife would have high anxiety about creating a meal mm -hmm. or trying to dress herself for some kind of event or something. Like yeah. it's a visual creativity or uh, senses creativity of food or anything else. Yep. S same thing hmm. that I would experience going into like a conversation. Yeah. So to me, that tells me it's not that there's people that are not creative. It's just everyone is creative in their specific area. Yeah, right? I agree. So even if it's, you know, if it's making food, if it's um, creating conversation, if it's creating, you know, I guess converse, 
people who are good at conversations are essentially writers in their head, but it's an immediate like performance yeah. art kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, I just, I want no it's, part of it, being improv on that improv, stage. Uh, improv, basically. I mean, you're good on right. your feet. You can speak and, and you know, you're probably good at public speaking and there's all sorts of other realms that you're probably great at. But, right. you know, sitting down and looking at a floor plan and, you know, thinking through to design problems is probably something they're not even interested in or can't do. I, I Interestingly, do. I found when I did you know take a swing at architecture for three years after college when i had to work out in the entirety of a floor plan man mm -hmm. that would really that it was that was some real horsepower yeah uh, that you'd have to commit oh, mentally yeah. to to get anywhere and it's just i i never got to a point where i felt like i can do this consistently mm -hmm. I've I've since gotten to a place where I can work those kind of things out when like just friends are talking to me about hey we've got a yeah. floor plan we're thinking about we can't afford an architect we just love your opinion you know and I can sit down and and work with them a lot more easily than than I ever remember being able to do it in the past oddly yeah. but no yeah I mean that's some yeah when um I think it was. Two years ago, we I had sat down with a client that I was working with at the other firm I was working for, and they were like, "We just want to work with you. You seem like you know, you know what you're you're doing." And we didn't, didn't want to involve like the, some of the higher ups, I think. But I was just like, "I can't." Is that how you, know. you lost your job? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, and I was like, "I can't do that." I mean, I, that was something that you know I discussed with the you know the management and right. things like that. But I was just they weren't they didn't want to work with. They won't let me off the chain for that. Yeah, I was like, eh, it was kind of. You know? yeah, that's kind of a, 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 like, wow, thank you. But yeah, I was just like, I was, you know, I'm, I was very nice to him and things like that, but I didn't want to overstep my bounds, I feel like. And that, at that point, I was just like, I, I need to, I felt like the, I was, I hit a ceiling there. Right. In terms of uh, hmm. growth. Yeah, sure. So in, in thinking about uh, creativity, where it comes from, mm -hmm. my own hypothesis, theory, whatever, that everyone's uh, creative. We're just all working on different things. Yeah. I've, in, in thinking on the process of creativity myself and how it can apply to anything, um, it, it, it uh, branches over into talking about our purpose as to if each of us are actually creative in some way, which mm -hmm. I believe we are, yeah, it to me there's a common. All right, so we're all creative. Why are we all creative? And it, that to me gets into our purpose, like not individually, but as a species or overall. Like, what is the purpose of everything going on here? Yeah. And to me, it seems like the purpose is is essentially. Uh, at a, at a most basic level, our, our purpose is creativity. And mm -hmm. that would be uh, going into the realm where you're skilled and comfortable, be it food preparation, yeah. conversation, writing, connectivity, visual design, whatever, going into where the unknown things are in those areas of creativity, yeah, where the chaos absolutely. is, and working on that chaos to turn it into things yeah. that are actually known. So for me now, when I think about our purpose, I feel like our purpose is to further bring chaos into the corral of our collective understanding. Yeah. Be it, you know, more advanced forms of uh, uh, economics, um, psychology, learning more about that, yeah, it's a, a human, I think it's a human nature thing to bring order out of chaos. I think that's yeah, uh, through ingenuity or whatever. I mean, industries and things like that to to wrestle a problem and then figure it out and move on to the next thing. I think right. that's just a, a species thing, like you said. And to me, I, I, I feel like if I were to make the whole thing basic, I feel like we serve as a conduit in some mm -hmm. sense for organizing further information. Yeah. True information, yeah. right? So Just documentation and things like yeah, that. Yeah, essentially documentation and turning what is currently chaos, which 
doesn't exist, but actually the unknown thing that we don't understand, working on that, mm -hmm. finding that dragon to slay in that manner, yeah, and bringing it back and presenting it to the collective us yep. to say, hey, did did I do my job right? Did I did I bring something back that wasn't here already within our realm yeah. of of order? Um, and it's interesting to think like, all right, there's a a swing at like our purpose, but what's our meaning? There's there's this difference between those two that I don't even really know how to <laughs> distinguish. But um, when you think of purpose and creativity, what what kind of things come to mind for you? Um, I don't know. I think we're yeah we're all here to like learn something. I feel like, and then we're also here to teach as well. So I think if we're gonna be going through life and you know if we're gonna learn something new, I think we should share that with someone else or or vice versa. I think there's something to be said about that. I think there's, uh, I think a lot of people just go through life and they're just kind of like, they just, they learn something, but they keep it to themselves. Or, you know, I think that just, it's making life harder for others later I've, on. I've been accused of that on accident. I think because <laughs> of my introverted nature. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, certainly. I learned a lot um, from people around me, mm -hmm. uh, Irvin Serrano, Chet Williams. I, I mean, my wife, uh, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm constantly so focused on how am I going to keep me and my family afloat yeah. being self-employed, yeah. and I'm constantly pulling in any information I can to, to make that happen Right. that I sometimes, uh, in my lack of understanding social cues of other people wanting to do the same thing, right. but not maybe being... Uh, I, th I think I'm just a little overly self-centered, not realizing that other people might not know what I know and mm -hmm. could benefit from the information sometimes. Well, yeah, it's again, like, you know, it comes down to like emotional intelligence, I think, and some people don't. Pretty low on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, some people just don't have any and they're just kind of like, they're, you know, all, out for themselves, I feel like, and it's just, mm. it's a self-serving kind of lifestyle. But see, I, I wonder... I feel like they, they withhold information to maybe better themselves. I oh, I'm I def uh, I hate saying that out loud, but I've I don't think I've done that intentionally, but I've definitely well, yeah, I probably think felt does to like some we've got an advantage. Let's not tell yeah. anyone how we're doing maybe this right. kind of thing or something. Right. I believe I believe that that's with any kind of thing in life. I think everybody does it to some extent. Yeah. But yeah, it's um, kind of like don't tell anyone the recipe to Coca Cola because yeah, exactly. you know, huh? But, yeah, that's a uh, that that's a really weird one. But you know, you you have to uh, you have to bounce things off of people. Like the the act of creativity is incomplete unless what you've created is then presented to others to reject and mm -hmm. learn from. Yeah, you know. So, hmm. What are what are some of the moments you can remember in your trajectory so far that have been kind of aha moments of things that you've discovered that here's here's something I've learned that I'm going to keep with me as I keep mm. building this thing for myself. Well, I've learned a lot of business over the last few years. I didn't know anything about business. And so I started learning about different ways of doing taxes and this and that and finances and things like that. And then I also moved into cinematography and photography i knew nothing about that as well so what are you doing in cinematography and photography well i'm just saying cinematography in terms of like just video mm -hmm. um but yeah photography i learned you know remember always keep the names fancy when you're talking about uh, yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> well my cinematography channel on youtube <laughs> exactly uh i don't know i've just yeah photography has actually been a really it really helps me with architecture i think um, now how so uh, spatially, yeah. Um, you know, really looking at a, a space. If I was photographing an interior space, I, I think I would look at it differently now than if I did didn't know anything about photography. Why is that? You think? Um, lighting is one. Um, now, does it does it back influence or influence how you design now that you've it definitely tried influences how I design. Spaces? Yeah, I think that really helps now. Hmm. Um, especially looking at the end product, especially yeah. if there's furnishings or anything like that, that can make a big difference in the end in terms of like photography. Um, I don't know. I just, it, it, window placement, 
um, floor floor you know, the wall window wall ratio and things like that. It's just the size of windows, the spacing, um, everything down to like just you know the 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 shadows in a room and things like that. And and also you know how to adjust the camera settings for you know if you don't have the the correct light or working within that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a different realm, basically. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it just that's that's really helped me visualize and spatially understand how and what the space will look like at the end. Right. So photography really helped me. Cinematography, um, drawing, not so much. I mean, I've really had no outside influences in that in terms of in the last few years. Hmm. Um. But you know, I, now I just I do you know I'll sketch a floor plan and I'll throw it into CAD, so it's not really like something I dwell on for weeks and things like that. What's your process with with working with clients on on a residential situation? How do you go through the process of learning their uh, conflict points, their mm -hmm. desires, and coming up with some kind of concept that works well? Yeah, between you and them, and creating something that's going to meet their needs, solve their problems. Um, first of all, I'll kind of get to know them as people and kind of give them a questionnaire almost and mm -hmm. kind of understand. Now, as an introvert, how do you do that? Well, I mean, yeah, you have to come outside of your, your shell, I guess, and <laughs> to understand what people actually, I mean, it, as an introvert, you actually understand people better than most extroverts. Is it that you, you understand them well, but just aren't comfortable? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what it is. Maybe it's because you understand <laughs> them that it makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> No, but yeah, I mean, to understand people, you have to, you know, get to know them and to understand their their ways and what they do every day and mm -hmm. how they live and what they do. And I think that just becomes a, a a nice benchmark to see what they really want. And then you can kind of go design after that. Hmm. But usually they come in with a few ideas and Pinterest and things like that. So you just try to work with what they have and hope it, you know, works out in the end. But yeah. It, a lot of it's driven by, you know, say the wife comes in with her 30 Pinterest images and I want this for a countertop and this and that. And you, you definitely, you find, you, you find a way to get that stuff to work, but, um, you know, you try to, you don't try to dwell on the details too much initially. And then you kind of just work with them. I like to work with them on one-on-one -on -one in terms of creating a floor plan. I think that's really important, especially how they move around and, that mm -hmm. kind of thing and then also and then move towards what they do and how they relax and where they like to sleep and things like that right based on solar orientation you can get into the the nitty-gritty of it but um yeah i mean that's i'll i'll get into details later on with them but that's pretty right. much how i get into it with them it was interesting for me to uh, a friend of mine just uh bought a farm up north here in maine mm -hmm. and so a uh, friend of mine that I started an architecture firm with years ago went up and visited with that common friend yeah, and kind of helped them through a floor plan in renovating a barn for what they're going to be living in, mm -hmm. essentially. And when I started out with my friend, Caleb Johnson, you know, I could see where he had come from and where I was at. We were kind of, he was like three years ahead of me in architecture school okay, because I goofed off and he never did <laughs> um but to see where he was at at that time mm -hmm. and then to not have worked together now for probably 12 12 to 15 years yeah and then to see him again work through a floor plan with some people i mean oh, wow. he he had a you know a, a working rough draft of a floor plan within yeah 10 minutes yeah you know and he looked at all the the approaches, the sun angles, the views, uh, how they live, the things they want, like yeah, the ability, it's, it's like sketching, you know, he could just read all those things and create something just, you know, like that because right. of the, the repetition. It was really lucky for our friends to, to have access to someone like that because to pay for that experience is extremely expensive. Yeah. But, um, yeah. It, uh, yeah, especially when you keep changing your mind and things like that. So, well, the family had gotten to a point where they were like they had they had gotten to this initial design, yeah, and 
and then luckily they're like you you guys want to come look at it i didn't really have a ton to say because i don't know yeah. design like he does obviously now um but they had they had had a lot of difficulty and conflict coming mm -hmm. up with this really bad floor plan oh interesting. before my friend yeah. looked at it <laughs> you know they had this like six foot hall that was like 40 feet long and Oh, God. You know, and but instead of him just kind of ripping it up and telling them they were all stupid and giving them the plan, then you know, yeah, I feel like he, you have to be kind of a therapist as well. You oh, yeah, you know he, I mean? like you he sat down and he was like explained to them why their ideas were going to be difficult, yes. and the, the yeah. experience that you would have in what they had designed, right? And then offered them a different solution that yeah. they were just all like. You know, we we're all right. No one here is going to argue with that. This looks awesome. You know, yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's another aspect of it. It's like you know, you have to understand the psychology of, uh, you know, getting to know who they are and 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 really be able to teach them. You know, right. this you probably shouldn't do that. Or right. you know. probably should, that's a bad idea. There, you don't want to do that. in yeah. a nice way. And you know, you have to be tactful. <laughs> right. Um. So to to go even more uh, offensive in the conversation. What do you yeah. believe about the the universe that gives us our meaning and purpose? The universe. I love mm. I love poking conversations with things that people think they should never talk about. So I don't know. I mean what you mean in terms of like the what we live where we live, like the world we live in? Like the I mean, do you do you believe that there's anything in this universe more intelligent than us that pushes back on mm. like I give you creativity to go out and be creative or is it just kind of a fluke and this weird creativity is a thing we have and yeah I think it's I think it's a little both maybe I think there's something out there that maybe could give us a an insight onto something better but I also yeah. think that you know we're as a human species I think we're just driven to create and build and and to figure out problems uh, I think that's mm. just a it's a human nature thing. The best I can come up with at this point is that it's all in service of information for some reason, hmm. which makes me look at information as like, what's so valuable about this that it's creating all this? It's probably more valuable than anything now. Well, yeah. I mean, we're in the information age, yeah. but every, every, any, every bit of anything that is in existence came about by the creative process. If you get down to the relationship yeah. between two atoms, mm -hmm. you'll have a, essentially a very minor consciousness and another minor consciousness having a relationship of attraction or repulsion. Yeah. And from that, over billions of years or whatever, it you know turns into this this thing of consciousness that we experience that yeah. we can't really prove that there's anything more, uh, can you say more sentient than us or more, you know, intelligent than us? Yeah. I mean, well, it depends on what you believe. I mean, if you're like into aliens and stuff, but I don't know. Well, but what do you believe? I don't know. I mean, like, I have no idea, but I'm just saying like, you know, there's people out there that still believe that stuff, but I think there's, yeah, I think there's something well, out there that. I mean, just running the numbers. What's that? There's got to be aliens. Well, yeah. I mean, what, what was alien, Area 51 and stuff for and that kind of thing, but I would right. think there would be, I, you know, there's too much, there's too much security there to even say that there isn't. That could just be another weird Air Force base. I mean, could they'll be. shoot you on any Air Force base that you're going on <laughs> yeah, to, true. you know. <laughs> true. There was a lot of those in Montana, so. Oh, really? Or no. I, oh, Idaho, there was one. There was, I drove by this one, and it was, like, highly secured and hmm. sort of a, a weird place, and there's weird things that happen there all the time, so. Hmm. Yeah, we just went through the Southwest on the way back from California yeah, saw this photos. winter. Yeah, And uh, I wanted to go by the Trinity site, and I would love to have gone by like um, Area 51 and all that north of yeah. Vegas. It's been kind of just kitschy, fun, and everything else. Mm. But I, it's just it's it's so interesting to me to to ponder creativity, and then this kind of observer effect that you can see at um, you know a, a, a quantum physics kind of level, yeah, and why that matters at all. But then, like entanglement, and they're they're all connected. 
somehow, but we'll never know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> unless you break in there, and and it is and it is you know to go off the deep end here. It, it's very interesting to me that if we are essentially um, s- servants of information, mm-hmm. essentially, yeah. that the ultimate moral at that point mm-hmm. would be truth. Yeah. Because if you're assembling information, the only error that is possible is falsehood. And if something is false, then it is wrong and does not contribute to the overall uh, construction of information. I agree, yeah. And to uh, to see how that plays into our own lives and to realize that there is no ability for... Uh, not truth. There's no ability for a lie or deception until consciousness arises. Hmm. And then when you see consciousness arrive, even at the most, you know, insignificant level, not insignificant, but minor levels of like moths, moths deceive by like patterns on them. They deceive Hmm. to look like a tree or they deceive to, and you know, is or they they deceive to look like there's a face on them even yeah which will repel predators it's just yeah. you know how all that comes into being just by chance that the ones that look like a tree don't get eaten or you know but there there's no ability for or adaptive through years of being eaten right then, you know. right like years and years of the ones that are you know day yeah. glow orange they're <laughs> easy to pick off yeah, exactly. you know but the ones that look like bark Right. But when you have like a face on a moth or even that, but we, we, we mirror that in our own, you know, do these genes make me look fat? Yeah. Yeah. No, they, you look great, sweetie. And I will never <laughs> say, you know, the, we know that the handling of information uh, is, is sensitive. Yeah. But it, it's also, you're also responsible too. I think that a, a huge thing yeah, is responsibility, uh, and and not creating. You know, even with Area 51, you think that you know there's a responsibility of information there that if you told anybody that you'd have masses of people coming down there, like getting down there. Well, I mean, that's that's where you get Bob Lazar and and exactly. all those kind of people yeah. that you know claim to have worked there. Yep. Uh, then have been attempted to have been erased as having a presence there yeah. anyways, and then seeing that they've actually been there. And it's kind of, you know, that, that's always kind of like there. there's this. Well, that goes back to your deception thing, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, did he really work there then? And it's like, yeah, yeah I guess he did. Yeah, yeah. Like, how long has that been around, that information? So, I don't it, know. It's, it's weird stuff. Yeah. But it's it's <laughs> intriguing. and it's, It is. It's also conspiratorial, which is another part of the human mind that yeah. um, is, is that part of the creative process is is part is one aspect of creativity, a mind that could propose all the things that could be working contrary to mm. um, contrary to the perception of truth. Mm in any way, you know, that, yeah. that there's kind of, I don't know, sentinels, if you will, that have a more conspiratorial mind yeah. as far as spotting things that are consistently off kilter with the natural flow of truth, that they can pick out these certain things yeah. and say, these aren't being represented properly. It might mean this. Right. Because I get kind of offended by by the uh, conspiratorial mind at times, especially mm-hmm. with the last four years that we went through and yeah. everything else. But at the same time, there's people like that. So that right. must mean that they served some purpose in the past and they got together and made more of those people. Correct, yeah. <laughs> and we still have them. Yeah. So they mean something and they serve some purpose. Yeah, I think you need to have those kind of people to in order to, you know, see the other side, I think. I think that's Yeah, maybe that's everything in life, I think. I think if you have too much of one thing, it's you have one person that's kind of like, hey, this is not right, you know. I think that's a, they're like kind of almost like a a person that kind of like a, you know, foreshadowing right. something else later in life or something. Well, it's, it's an extremely important thing <clears throat> to have people in your life that 
uh, will vehemently disagree with you. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't, another thing. you're going to have an echo chamber and yep. you're going to become a monoculture that gets taken out very easily by one single little right. bug yep. <laughs> in yeah. the system. And Yeah, you know. I mean, and that's, and that's pretty much what I feel like about architecture. It's just so homogenous sometimes. It's, you know, it, it anything could... It's just, it's so one-dimensional, I feel like. And then, you know, one little, you know, hiccup in the economy, everybody gets, you know, let go and that kind of thing. So mm. that's another thing of my business is trying to create something that's sustainable. How, what do you think the the future business model of architecture is going to look like with a far more drastic decentralization of even the workplace uh, mm. with everything we've experienced? Yeah, I think remote working is kind of like the new thing now. So I don't know how that's going to work really in architecture, seeing as it's so more hands-on and it's, you know, studio culture is so important, especially working with other people. Right. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, you're working at home. And again, like you're saying, like it's an echo chamber. And, mm -hmm. you know, most people are thinking that they're doing something right and maybe they're not doing it. Well, the an interesting thing. Up to the thing, standards that they should be doing. but Yeah, the interesting thing there, though, is that as technology approaches a similarity to actual consciousness as far as your experience to put on VR goggles and yeah. someone can just stick up whatever on a site mm -hmm. and you can put on the goggles and you can look wherever and yeah. essentially be at the site at that location. In theory, yeah. It obviously will not be the same thing as physically being there, but as that that difference between virtual, you know, yeah. virtual reality and actual reality, as it gets closer, there's just simply going to be less of a need to to actually you're, be yeah, working in the same space correct. constantly. I think so. Yeah, I think that's going to be. It's going to be like you know people going moving to CAD back in the day instead of hand drafting. You know, right? There's always going to be people that are going to be like, oh, I just want to hand draft this, or right. It's there's going to be some pushback, and eventually, you know, the generations will eventually just become everything will be virtual and right we'll be talking to holograms in the hallway or whatever you know <laughs> at business meetings and who are you talking to <laughs> exactly yeah yeah i uh in photography the you know the transition from film to digital yeah and you you know you still have a lot of artsy people that are you know shooting film for you know just for shooting film like yeah. my studio manager has been shooting some film stuff and it definitely has a, a different organic something going on but it's so imperceptible to the normal person mm -hmm. but there there is something there that 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 they see and they get a, a feedback from yeah um but there there's that resist there's always that resistance to change especially when it comes to a creative endeavor like there there'll always yeah. be these people that think like well that's just too easy because there's such a high dynamic range in that camera you don't have to actually change out the color temperature of the light bulbs right. and yeah you don't have to worry about lighting anything it's just three clicks of the shutter and then in post you put it all together and mm -hmm. y you'll have people that will resist all these new things that make your process easier but by making the technical part of the process easier what remains yeah and what remains is that that ability of composition and lighting rather than this hurdle mm -hmm. of uh technical yeah. things that hang you up from actually getting to the really creative part as far as or the fundamentals the yeah. visual yeah and i think the fundamentals come into play actually more when you start using technology way more right so i think like you know moving and just using cad as an example it's like or cad to revit even right yeah you know, that's a that's a big jump so i think you know as you're designing i feel like it's even more powerful now to be doing a 3d model as you're adjusting a floor plan you know it's right. building it in the background so is revit pretty much the standard now for 3d modeling um, and i would say so i mean it's getting there um I was never a big Revit fan because I just never really learned it. But yeah, I you know I, in school I had learned Rhino and all sorts of other things. I mean, we had SketchUp and stuff, but it wasn't as big back when I was working. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, Rhino, or, uh, Revit is getting pretty big. I think mm. it's especially in uh, it's pushing its way into residential. Yeah, which I think is you know I think it's a good thing and it's a bad thing, especially if if it depends on the the type of work you do. And it's I don't know if it's saving you any time later on if there's a huge, you know, change or something like that. So 
Hmm. I think that's a another issue, I guess, with Revit. But when I was in school, we fast. had CAD, Revit, and ArchiCAD. Mm -hmm. um, are those are ArchiCAD still around? Going mm, some strong? firms I feel like use it, especially if they're like Mac based or something. Really? Um, but now I think CAD is on Mac, so I think that's. It's not really an issue anymore. And Revit just kind of marries into CAD. Yeah, Revit, I think, is done by Autodesk. So I think you have to either, yeah, it doesn't matter hmm. what platform you use. But yeah, it, it's, you can use CAD and then you can import, you know, your floor plan into Revit and build off of that. But right. I don't know. I've always just used Rev or CAD. So um, my firm was starting to use Revit a lot more. Um, most of the people that were being hired after me were fully fluent in it from school so i right. think that's gonna be a huge push in the next 10 years yeah i just remember staring at the black screens on cad and with the yeah. yellow and blue and magenta lines. i think it's easier on the eyes than the white screen or revit so i don't know that's just my that's what i was trained to do so uh, i don't know it's mostly just the aesthetic of it to me that was yeah. just like ah. <laughs> i so like it and it, it's just to me it's simple and yeah it's kind of minimalistic to me i would i would just endlessly get lines that I'm I'm just not that technically organized mm -hmm. to where I would have like all of my line like I'd end up like not having things snap to a certain Oh yeah, that's, thing. I've had that. Yeah. And I you'd go down through layers of drawings and things would be off like just, you yeah. know, hundredths of an inch and not like uh, I know. So so bad. It's super precise and you have to be careful with, you know, when you, I've made those mistakes, but at the same time, it's like, you have to learn that stuff. And yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think the, the generation now, I don't think they even know, know how to use CAD. So really, I don't think they even, no, the, none of them did the ones that I work with. Huh. So, so what know. are, what are they learning? Just Revit? Just Revit. So they do, do they pull their, uh, contract yeah. documents out of Revit? Yep. Everything. I mean, you can do really? it literally from soup to nuts on, in Revit. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Huh. It's super efficient, but I, I just never, never, I mean, I know some things in it. I can work in it, but I'm not fluent like most of the newer, newer right. generation of architects. Well, as you go along starting your own firm, are you going to have to become fluent in that, you think? or Maybe. I mean, it depends on like what, you know, the contractors have and things like that. You may have to, to merge with that. But right now, it's still, I can do CAD just fine and model it in Rhino or SketchUp or Right. Whatever's out there. So what do you see as the the major challenge for you moving forward with all the different outlets for creativity that you have and what you know you want to do? What what are the major challenges in front of you and what do you see as options for getting past that? Well, I think prioritizing like what I want out of my companies, you know, I want to be able to do architecture just about every day and in design and things like that but i also want to move into you know woodworking and be able to sell furniture and uh photography and all that sort of thing and and involve myself in other industries as well just not architecture but that one that's basically my you know organizing my life where i can just do you know two to three days of architecture a week and then eventually you know mix in some other odds and ends of interests that i have Keeping it, uh, keeping it a little more well-rounded than uh, yeah. I mean, like with that's why I wanted to do architecture after landscape architecture. I just felt like if I got a master's in landscape architecture, I'm just I'm stuck in that industry. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to. I, I guess they call it academic incest. Huh. It's like you know, just to have like the same, um, you know, homogenous education, right. and then you're stuck doing that. I guess, but I, I don't know. I don't. I just wanted to diversify my my ideas and um, interests. Hmm. So uh, in moving forward, mm -hmm. what what are you going to implement in your, your process to actually make that happen? Do you have a, a like a daily process that you go by kind of like Eric does with- Yeah, he does like the making in the or... morning and the management in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, it depends on the day and I think it's, I'm not as rigid in terms of setting myself up every day to do the same. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I want to keep it loose and I want to be able to be flexible with how I approach each day. I mean, if I have a you know, a me meeting in the morning or something like that. I can't meet or I don't want to have to be able to rearrange everything. I just want to be able to work day by day and 
kind of work like that way at least for the foreseeable future i don't want to have to like so, yeah, I'm not like, you know, I'm not picking my phone after noon or whatever, but I thought that was funny. Um, you know, I think he's, I think Eric has a really great understanding of how to organize his company and that. And I think it's great that he, it works for him, but I don't know if I could do the, the same kind of making model right. in the morning. I mean, sometimes I'm more creative in the afternoon sometimes more of a more of a night person <laughs> yeah I, I think so lately as as of lately i've been working longer nights and things like that did and you then, see the the short film that he put together yeah you guys yeah. Uh, collaborated on that yeah yeah it was really cool we we screened it at a film architecture film festival awesome. down in uh new york and the the kid doing the the stuff at the beginning with legos and stuff was my son and oh okay i thought that was but, his son yeah no it was, oh, okay. it was, after the shoot, we we just kind of realized we need a little bit more footage to tie in kind of a backstory or whatever here. So I was like, okay. oh, I can get my son to just work on some Lego stuff, and I'll get some motion of him, you know, mm -hmm. working on it and stuff. And yeah, that was really fun. And that yeah, that's great. I mean, you guys developed a narrative, which is also very similar to architecture. I mean, you have to develop a narrative. He developed primarily the narrative along yeah. with a with an advisor, and then we kind of worked on a shot list together awesome and i think we shot that in a single day the whole thing and wow. yeah single day or day and a half i mean the the footage with my son oh, okay. was l later i just oh, kind of like i'll get i'll get this when i get home kind of yeah. thing but uh yeah the editing process and everything obviously took a lot longer but all the major shooting i believe was mostly done in a day wow at his location down east yeah um he did some other things with you guys. I think uh, you guys were doing a photography session at one of his houses, and you know, yeah, it was like a vlog style, yeah, vlog style. Yeah, I need to have him in for another podcast too to see yeah. what what he's been up to and and where things have gone for him. He's been doing some really nice videos of of a pro a project he's yep. doing out on an island and stuff yeah, too. Those. And yeah, it's really cool. He's been a big inspiration as far as him <laughs> telling us you you really need to start pushing stuff out to YouTube. It's just a great thing to get your name out there more and to have uh more video attached to your uh, website really helps with your google searches yep and everything so yeah we've been striving to do that continually to just awesome. come up with different ideas for videos and stuff that will be you know uh something that is good for our audience to listen to just conversations like this people who are striking out on their own to yeah. to learn from um what what have it what advice have you gotten from other people for going out on your own? Mm -hmm. And what advice would you give people going out on your own? I would say... Uh, gotten first. Well, uh, gotten? <laughs> um, I'd say, I don't know. Uh, they said, just do it. I mean, you can't just But sit how do you prepare for it? I don't know. I mean, I think there's debt? a certain... Yeah, <laughs> get rid of debt. And then also kind of just structure your, your business plan first i feel like a lot of people just jump into a business and they don't have like an idea of like how they're going to make money or where they're going to make money mm -hmm. i mean i kind of sketched it out and i was going to put that up on instagram but i think uh, having at least a business plan of a model that you can kind of use that as like a, a foundation i think that's paramount to just starting out on your own yeah and even if you nowhere close to it in five years yeah. you had something that gave you a trajectory that you revisit right and and adapt right and yeah exactly and, and being flexible with that that plan it's not so much just it's set in stone i think a lot of it's going to be you know adaptable to my specific lifestyle at the, at the moment mm -hmm. what what <clears throat> lifestyle concerns and uh desires do you have for putting into what you're forming right now um definitely trying to just uh I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just I've I've always been kind of like an organized, um, just schedule based person. So for me, it's very easy just to like start working, and then I can just every day I have something set up for myself, and mm -hmm. I, to keep myself busy and to keep myself motivated, I have to have like a schedule. Yeah. I feel like if you don't have that, you're not going to keep you know keep tabs on yourself. I feel like you're gonna either get kind of wayward with some of your ideas and. Because I, I do get like off on a tangent sometimes and I'm just like, oh, I spent like six hours on some random task and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it's like there goes the whole day. 
So it's easy to just kind of lose track of what your your main goal is for the day. And I think a lot of people probably would agree with me that you have to have some kind of base, you know, deadline for yourself, you know, self-imposed kind of, um, I don't know, uh, just some type of goal to reach mm-hmm. each week, I feel like. And then as you get more and more of those goals created and accomplished, I feel like then it becomes more apparent of where your direction is going to be. Okay. Uh, now, what assets do you have accumulated at this point to help your business grow? You mean like uh, like computers and stuff? Well, I mean like website, marketing oh, so plan. I have uh, my Instagram, which is at tfworks, underscore tfworks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also have my website, which is just you know starting out. I don't have anything on there except for, I think, one blog. And, um, and then right now I have, you know, just, uh, I have Facebook and LinkedIn and that kind of thing, but I'm just not really as active on there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also have a few other, you know, ideas for courses and things like that, that I have for drawing, um, people that are starting out and drawing things like that. So I'm going to try and get into that more and really get into YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, I think YouTube is probably like the only way to like really market yourself in this day and age. I think there's, you can do it through Instagram, but it's, I think it's, it reaches a larger audience when you threw it up on in, in like a video or something like that, or even just a tutorial. Right. Um, it reaches a vast amount of people compared to. Now with, with doing drawing tutorials, how's that return to income for design business? Well, I mean, you could definitely put tutorials up and then, you know, if you wanted to, it's almost like a paywall kind of thing where you, you know, you can go. Okay. So creating get, a separate smaller stream of money uh, around kind of uh, how-to videos essentially yep. Yep. for sketching. And, and then, you know, else. selling floor plans, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. um, that was kind of my main interest at first. And then I was just like, I started moving beyond that and just yep. kind of wanted to create different things. And that's still there, but I just don't have... I just don't know how much money that'll actually generate. Right. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things that it just some, it's so weird. Like I sit down with my kids in the evening and they can just say to themselves, what do we want to watch? Mm -hmm. And they can watch anything. Yep. When I was a kid, you had an option of like 12 channels. Yeah. And then like teenager went up to like 30 channels or something. And now- it's truly any language, any subject, anywhere, anything, yeah. you know? And uh, what you have is these people rising to the surface that just have this natural talent yep. of presentation or whatever. There's this guy, I think he's from the West Coast somewhere, a black guy that mm-hmm. just has the most soothing voice. Oh, really? And he does these incredible tech reviews. This and is on he, YouTube? Yeah, on YouTube. He's one of the one of the top people but he's just got this incredible like calm yeah but uh it's like this calm authority on whatever he's talking about and mm. whatever he's reviewing you're just like i don't care what he's reviewing i'm just gonna sit here and listen to this <laughs> yeah guy. I mean, it's amazing you yeah, know you could probably listen to it, like asmr kind of stuff like to fall asleep to yeah well it, it if i put him on and i was trying to go to sleep i'd be like i want to see what he's talking about <laughs> it's amazing um but he's just got this like incredible talent for like a presenter, mm-hmm. you know, um, good looking guy and just incredibly great voice for for what he's mm-hmm. doing, you know, and his mannerisms and everything else. Are, it's like all these X factors just came together in this person oh, wow. that achieved their own thing outside of like gatekeepers of corporate television. Right. You know, and so you have this opportunity of high, high connectivity on on no budget and you're we're getting to this point now where if you see something on youtube that looks like it was produced rather than the single individual creating it yeah you kind of write it off like it's I too well done yeah as far as like you can tell that there's some disconnect between the writing the personality and the production level yeah whereas if there's this kind of like the production quality is a little lower and then you know that like, oh, they're just recording it on a phone, but you're getting the true whatever of the person. Right. There's like this weird authenticity because the quality yeah. isn't there. Right. There's, there's something odd about that, but it, 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 uh, 
it's the same thing that we have where we have this high, high connectivity of information, but yeah. this low ability for um, connectivity between people mm -hmm. in that realm. So someone could be highly influential in, in my life in, in, a, in a singular direction, like a Joe Rogan type of person or yeah. you know a, a media personality through YouTube, and yeah. you have an endless array of those yeah. people. Um, but because it's YouTube, there's millions of them essentially, and not just 12 like we had when I was a kid. Right. And so everyone across the US would have this commonality to at least one of 12 presenters or something right. at that time. And yeah. it far more connected us as a country or a state or town that we all watched this one thing last night or something. Mm -hmm. But now it's like everyone just watches exactly what they want to watch on YouTube. Yeah. And it doesn't usually connect with the people that you're running into work or whatever. There's something True. weird going on in there. I don't know what it is. But yeah, I just, it's like this weird consumption of content. But that it, it, I think that helps creativity if you want to go back to that. I think if people yeah. wanted to watch something different, you know, they could be looking at something completely different and um, – as opposed to like their neighbor and they could be coming up with a different idea for something else in the world. You know, I think that's, it gives us another option to, um, to create. I, I don't right. know if there's actual people out there that are want to watch the same 12 channels. I, right. I don't think you could ever go back to that. You know what I mean? Like that's just, it's a weird. Yeah. I also, I also have this weird theory that the, this idea of us being essentially conduits for information for the growth of yeah. inf true information is why it seems like uh, those with good intentions that are closer to truth went out in the end. Because if you take the evil empires or whatever yeah. that you will, like Nazis, North Korea, whatever, yeah, um, that they're manipulating truth to such a degree to match their... Uh, desires rather mm -hmm. than the truth outside of their desires that they pile this information one on top of the other but it starts to go wrong because it's not true right it's it's manipulated towards their end and that that ultimately topples and does not stand true yeah and and the thing i found is that i realized that at every single moment of any part of my life any deviation towards a manipulation of the perception of truth mm -hmm. it, you start to build a faulty foundation yeah so that's why it's difficult if you're faced with that situation of you know do these genes make me look fat yeah like uh you know government like, talk no <laughs> truth honesty <laughs> yeah. you know is a really weird thing but yeah i th i think the true information creativity and creativity only being worth something if it strikes true right. to the collective consciousness of so many people that would perceive a work of art or anything else that mm -hmm. they'd kind of cast this vote of saying this creativity is justified to be introduced into our order, if yeah. you will. Well, I think, you know, now you look at kids these days or, you know, they don't know, they don't have, they don't know what's valid. You know what I mean? Like right. they, they don't have a, a benchmark of, prior to what you're what you've experienced you know i think right. they they'll just they'll believe it you know right i wonder I, if if the current do you think the current generation the millennials or whatever we want to call them whatever they want to be called <laughs> is how we should put what, that what is it a gen y or something or is it gen z now i think gen y is millennial i don't know what's after z uh, yeah whatever the, the current people between the ages of like 35 and 20. Yeah. Um, do you think they have a better perception of truth? Because, I mean, look at the last presidency, like not to get political, but mm -hmm. like the this whole rise of like alternative facts and mm -hmm. the, you know, to watch Kellyanne Conway, you think, wow, there's a really intelligent person that is really manipulating perception. You know, I mean, no doubt about it. Yeah. She's intelligent and can think on her feet. But I watch it and I'm like, wow, th this seems so misleading. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, it depends on 
uh, how you were brought up to. I think that uh, has a lot to do with it and how you uh, hmm. how you can look for truth in things. I think that's you know the main reason. I think people are it's too easy now to consume any kind of information, and it's they'll take it with a grain of salt. I think. Right. And I think people are now starting to wake up, I think, and realize, like, hey, they're feeding us crazy information. Yeah. Did point. you watch The Social Dilemma? No. I actually started watching. I just never finished it. Really good. Yeah. Uh, towards the end, you see that these people that created these things, like, I think they had the guy of Pinterest and mm-hmm. face, talked about Facebook a lot and everything else. Yeah. There, it seems like there's something something alive within us collectively that's unable to resist feeding off of us at our own peril because of the gain that it brings the individual. Mm. Do you know what I mean by yeah. that? That It's something like these people were creating this thing that they knew they were powerless to resist in the end creation of what they would consume that they were making. Yeah, they, they were a making <laughs> something that was going to consume them and they couldn't resist doing it. Correct. Yeah. Just, and they wouldn't pull up from that. They'd be yeah. like, well, we'll be able to handle it, you know? Yeah. And with any advance in technology, there's going to be a, a detriment to society until it figures out the learning curve and how to handle it. Right. And everything else. But it, 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 it's like you want to think there's like a secretive uh, whatever cabal behind it all trying to manipulate us, but it's really just us. Each one of us. Yeah, I think so. Can't resist any advantage or any uh, ability to to have more even at, at the expense of being less. It's weird. Yeah, I don't know. It's a, It's a weird dichotomy of like... Either you know it's true or you don't. I think the people that um, that put out this kind of information, I think they're either trying to manipulate the way you think or it just they're trying to basically just, you know, take over. It's, just, it's all about power, I feel like, in, yeah. it's at the in the end. So I wonder if it... If they can control your mind, then, hmm. you know, they can control... Every, pretty much everything else. And then we talked about Neur- Neuralink. What is that? <laughs> Elon's coming out with? Oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'd heard some podcast where, where he was talking about, I think they're calling it Neuralink. It's like a implant in mm-hmm. your head that can help uh, anything from people. I think they're having seizures to like paralytics eventually and, oh, okay. and everything else, which, you know, kind of like the idea of gene manipulation to help like sickle cell anemia. Yeah. But then also, where else can it go, and where where can we scare, be scared and paranoid of where it could go as well? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. I mean, that's the same thing. It's always been like old age, the age old uh, robot theory. I mean, it's yeah. like you know, how much of that do you want to take over your lives? That my my theory <clears throat> of our fear of artificial intelligence embodied in like robotics or whatever yeah. else. Um, the on, like we possess articulated general intelligence. Mm-hmm. Why would we not trust a, a robot that had generalized articulate intelligence like ourselves? Hmm. I think it's because we could not perceive that they would have the ability for emotion. And there's something with the intelligence of emotion that gives you this check to maybe I shouldn't kill everyone in the state yeah. to make it more fertile for having solar power that will serve the intent yeah. for AI better. Yeah. You know, it, there's something about that, that emotional check that is human that would yeah. not be embodied in AI potentially. Yeah. I think that's a, I, I mean, that's understandable. I mean, like most people are probably afraid of, you know, that even happening. I mean, there's, I think, I think it's just a general human fear to, to think that, I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking that, but I mean, there's there's are also evil people out there that could write into the software that could create that. You know what I mean? It's not like like, they, they like a mind we of see with all the animators with the weird things that they put into cartoons and stuff. Yeah, exactly. 
Because they're the same type of people that just doing code and they're yep. like, oh, this will be fun. Yeah, I know you, I do you don't even know what's in there. It could just like one day just turn and all these robots start killing people. So it's like it it, yeah. it could happen. But I always used to put my name or something weird in any renderings that I do of <laughs> like an arch like yeah. a, a building like or a something. watermark almost. Like if there is a stone wall, I'd be writing stuff in there and oh, nice. just seeing if anyone didn't catch it. You know, and <laughs> then you'd go by the job site and see the rendering on the sign. You'd be like, see where it says, you know. <laughs> That was always a fun little Easter egg yeah. to put in there. But Yeah, we used to do that in renderings, like, uh, you know, in school and stuff like that, and just random images in the background. I saw somewhere, someone got in trouble for something. <clears throat> they put, like, what did they do? It was, it was for some, like, really big uh, thing, like a World Trade Center proposal oh, wow. or something that they put <laughs> something in that got found out, and, like, oh, no. I think someone got fired for it. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So when you're not uh, when you're not trying to create a business and everything else, what do you do for fun? Um, pretty much just uh, hang out with my dog, fly fish, do a mm. bunch of uh, you know outdoor stuff, yep. mountain bike. Uh, I used to like to run and stuff like that. So I don't know. I just I like the outdoors, so I'm always outside. What What have you learned from fly fishing that applies to designing? Um, patience. Be some, oh, there you go. It's all about patience. Yeah. <laughs> do you tie your own flies? I used to. I, I mean, I have a bunch now that I just made, so I don't really, I don't have like the little stand or anything like that anymore. Yep. I had to move and had to get rid of most of that stuff. So, hmm. Hmm. but yeah, I mean, I used to tie my own flies and, um, you know, go out to the Gallatin River and Montana must add beautiful oh, yeah. places for oh, that. Oh yeah, all the time. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm missing spring fishing right now. So, hmm. <laughs> now, were you the kind of guy that would fish wherever the fishing was good, or did you have to be in a beautiful fl place fly fishing? No, I would go pretty much to the areas that I knew that were, you know, pretty much hopping yeah. most of the most of the year. Hmm. Um, I mean, those are so rich with. There's, so, I mean, you catch probably three or four every single time you go out. Yeah. I mean, it depends on how long you're out there, but yeah, I mean, I just I love doing it and getting in the water, and I don't know, it's just relaxing to me. It, my uh, my dad loves fly fishing, but if it's not uh, beautiful scenery, mm -hmm. he's where I get my visual sense from, I'd imagine. Yeah. But if it's not like beautiful scenery, he's just kind of like, meh. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah, I mean, everything's beautiful there, so it's hard to like. Yeah, want. it's Montana, yeah. right? So the, he lived in Michigan for a while, and the steelhead salmon would get huge, and they would come up this river near we lived from yeah. the lake. And they'd come right to this dam, and you could just like catch them nonstop. Yep. And they were huge. Oh yeah. But it was just not that pretty of an area. And so my dad was like, "I don't think you ever fished there even once." I remember going over there, and <laughs> people would catch fish that they'd want to keep alive till they leave, and they'd mm -hmm. have to tie them to like cinder blocks. So yeah. They wouldn't and get away. Yeah. I mean, they're big. But... Yeah. They're strong too. I mean, you pick them up, and they're like, they want to get rid. They want to oh, yeah. get off. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's hard. I mean, yeah. That, I mean, the trout up there is just like it, the water's so clean, so you can literally just reach in the water and grab one. I mean, wow. And it's just it's so. I mean, in the little tiny streams yeah. off the river, you'd see occasionally massive steelhead. Oh yeah, salmon. they're laying eggs or something. You know. Yeah, like, like, you could go over there and just pick them up, but yep. it was illegal to touch them. I think. Yeah. Something about it. I think yeah. After a certain time of year, you can't touch them or something. I can't remember. Hmm. On steelhead. Interesting. So are you from Western Mass originally? Yep. And family lives there? And uh, Family does live there, yep. And uh, uh, my most of my family lives out in Boston or Cape Cod, so right. we go out and visit them and that kind of thing. My sister lives in North Carolina, so. North Carolina? Yeah. Oh, cool. Where out in North Carolina? Uh, she lives in Raleigh. Ra Raleigh. Yeah. yeah well, she lived in Greensboro and went to school there, and then she moved out to Raleigh, so. I think you said that wrong, though. Was, Was it Raleigh? Greensboro. Uh, Greensboro. You're very not I'm going to tell you one now. Yeah. I grew up in, in Virginia. Okay. And I perfected my southern accent that is bad, but. <laughs> yeah, I always, uh, like, like out in horse country, like. Uh, I was uh, in the or... Shenandoah Valley, which is kind okay. of horse country. I went camping there a few times. I did the Shenandoah Valley uh, State Park. and. Oh, cool. But yeah, I mean, that's a beautiful area. Yeah, it's a really beautiful area geographically, but the vinyl developments are just out of control. Oh, I know. Like yeah. I go back to where uh, the one development that I grew up in 
it was cool because all the houses were different mm -hmm. and it was in this area with really interesting hills and then all surrounding that was these pastoral hills you know and you go back now and instead of just one development it's like everybody oh. did a development on every single hill yeah. everywhere and there's no more cows or yeah, it's it's just kind of sad to go back and yeah, see. Yeah, I saw that. I mean, that's similar to West Virginia where I went to school and it mm. was just a, you know, like huge housing developments going in and high rises and especially in Morgantown and yeah. that sort of area. And, and it just, it's, everything is being built up and I think everybody's just looking for their own little plot of land. Right. <laughs> Hence why, why I'm in Maine, just kind of trying to stay in a place that's beautiful but doesn't have as many people. Yeah. So. That's why, yeah, Montana was getting out of control too. So Really? Well, where I was living, Bozeman, but I yeah. mean, there's, outside of Bozeman, it's probably, you know, still really relatively rural, but um, mm. the, the cities are growing there. You know, there's, I think they said there's like 3,000 or 60 new people coming down there every day. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, in a year, it's like the five, in the six years that I was there, it was, you know, went from 35,000 people to like over 55 or 50. Sheesh. Yeah, it was crazy. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, there's a pretty significant amount of people leaving California. Right. Yep. Looking for Idaho, Austin, Montana, yep. wherever. Um, we were just out in California for a while and it, in the... I wasn't up in the San Francisco area, but mm -hmm. the times I have been to like San Diego, yeah. it, the homeless population is aggressive. Oh yeah. Really aggressive. Yeah. And there's a really big homeless population to, to a large degree in, in Ventura where we were, we were at as well. Oh wow. Um, and a lot of it's like mental health issues and, and yeah. stuff too. And, but I mean, it's just the weather it's a great place to be homeless, you know? Yeah. So if you're going to sleep outside, yeah. That's, yes. Dry, warm areas. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Great. But anywho, I thank you so much for yeah, no coming all this way out here to share uh, what you've been going through and yeah. where and where you're going. I, I, I think it's really cool to get a perspective of creatives that are starting to go out on their own and see how they're handling it, what yeah. they, what they see for the future and, and the experiences they've had, why they're going out on their own mm -hmm. and, and everything else. So yeah. really appreciate it. I really love uh, all the sketching and everything that you're putting up on your Instagram Thanks. channel. It's, yeah. it's uh, from attempting to do it myself. I know how <laughs> difficult it is, yeah. but I also know the, the, the tactile reward of creating those things and being able to go back and look through them and yeah i mean i've done so many and I, I really i actually take a lot of photos and then i sketch later or something like that or yep. you know i'll do that i do probably like two one to two a day hmm. typically wow. so now do you do that like as a practice like an, an intentional thing like ah, i better do those today because no i mean it's just it's like i'm sitting there watching tv or whatever you know i'll just i'll sketch something out on my oh. ipad or i'll just do it like in my sketchbook yeah. um you know or, or you know making dinner or something like that i'll just do one i don't know it's just more of just like something a habit it's not right. really something i feel like i need to do but it's just something that keeps my mind is it active. Is interesting for me in in architecture school we went to uh rome for i don't know two weeks or something mm -hmm. um and i remember uh, approaching the pantheon from one of the side streets like if you're facing the pantheon it was a side street over to the left yeah and uh, I remember just the striking thing of you're coming down a fairly narrow street mm -hmm. and then seeing this huge thing, like as you came down the street, it came into view, you know? Yep. And I remember like, holy cow. And I just had to stop and sketch that framed view, yeah. you know? And through sketching it, you, you know, you just, you notice all the little intricacies of this, right, yeah, the, the, the framing and... street and, and buildings, and then what you're actually looking at and the shadows and the columns and the, and then, uh, my wife and I went back there, I think for our 15 year anniversary. And it was mm -hmm. really neat to be able to go back to the same spot and, and photograph it. Oh, awesome. And then to have the two, yeah. you know, 15 years apart, you know, to, to have the, Two different the two things. Two different mediums, yeah. And to be able to go back to that exact mm -hmm. spot where you know you sat and sketched something and yeah. see how it's changed awesome. or whatever. And the thing I really love about the Pantheon is how much the, the ground has come up around it. Oh, really? Just the centuries and centuries of streets, you know, yeah. resurfacing or whatever else. It's like 
10, 15 feet tall around the wow. sides and back. Wow. But, you know, it's just grown. Yeah, we did a trip in high school. It was like to Ireland, Scotland, Wales, UK, that whole thing. And then we did like Switzerland for like two days mm -hmm. and Basel. And, Basel. and I, I think the the biggest thing I took away from that was just like, I think I did probably like five or six sketches like every place we did, you know, and it, and it really helped me like understand architectural detail and that kind of yeah. thing at that point. Because I have never seen anything, you know, like that was like the first exposure to like different cultures and to see good architecture in Europe is, yeah, it's really good. Yep, <laughs> definitely worth it. Yeah, we went to one of the Renzo Piano museums. This is just like, yeah, it was. Yep. We also we went to the I think it was a Gary building that was the Knoll Chair Spain. Museum. Oh, I don't I know. Think. That was that was super cool too. Cool. And we went to one building that had like a fabric exterior. It was all like plywood interior and structure, and then it oh, had wow. like this stretched fabric for the for the exterior skin and and everything. And yeah, that was super cool. But nice. Yeah, but uh, really really fun uh, yeah, to, to be able to sit down mm -hmm. and and to get to know you a little better. Yep. And uh, thanks for putting all those sketches up on Instagram. I really no enjoy going yeah, through them and seeing it. them. Uh, if anyone wants to see your stuff, it's uh, TF, TF underscore, underscore WRKS. WRKS. And your website? Uh, same thing. TF, uh, I think it's just all one word, TFWRKS.com. All right, cool. So yeah. That's where you can get more of Tom. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, check him out and see what you think. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. <laughs> and thanks for coming in, Tom. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.